So hello, everybody. Um, absolutely del delighted to welcome you into our new building um, in the management school this evening. So my name's Claire Leach, and I'm the interim dean um, at the moment. And it's my absolute pleasure to invite you to or to welcome you to the first in our masterclass series, which is sponsored by NatWest, our corporate guardians. So I think the last time we had an in-person masterclass was in 2019, so it seems so long ago, and we've had this fantastic relationship with NatWest since 2015, so this is a continuation um, of, of a great experience. So the, the theme for our masterclass this, this year is sustainability. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Duncan Pollard to speak um, with us this evening. So I had, a, I had the uh, a chance to have a brief um, conversation with Duncan um, this afternoon and have learnt a lot about him and his career. So he started off um, doing forestry at Aberdeen, and I think that is, you know, been the sort of bedrock for his career and also given him the vision and, and the, a long-term interest in sustainability. So he's worked both in the corporate and non-profit sectors and he spent nine years planning and operating world-scale world scale greenfield forests and pulp milk projects with Shell. So we had a really good conversation because when Duncan was at Shell, it was the time when Shell were doing a lot of scenario planning in the, in the 80s and had a, had a real reputation at that time for, for really being ahead of the game um, in, in that field. And then he moved into the World Wildlife Fund, so I got it right this time, um, working in a completely different sector and bringing, I guess, a business <coughs> perspective to that sector. And he was responsible there for their global conservation work and energy, working with forests um, and oceans. Um, but then decided to take a sort of another step back into the corporate world, originally thinking, exploring it as an opportunity to do a secondment with Nestle. Um, and I think that you work to embed sustainability um, across different areas of the business. And we did have a discussion that actually being working in this area, it can be quite a lonely job, especially when it's not as, as, as high a profile as it might do um, at the moment. So I think Duncan really wants this to be an interactive session and can talk about a number of really sort of key topics. So there's obviously sustainability, but there's a change management um, story and, and a lot of interest in that, but there also is a leadership element to the, this particular presentation. So I think the aim for, that Duncan wants to do is to have a couple of minutes sort of introduction and then stop and get um, invite questions or observations from you as, as the audience and then let's take things from there. So I think we're looking forward and we will have a wonderful session and learn some really interesting um, insights. So Duncan, it's all over to you. Thank you very much. And good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it is odd, isn't it? It's the first time I've been in front of a live audience, let's say, in-person audience, let's say, uh, for over two years. And it's probably the same for many of you as well. So um, yeah, let's, let's see how this goes. Uh, Claire's done a great introduction there, said most of uh, actually what I, what I wanted to say. I, I have swapped from company, corporate sector to, uh, uh, to NGO sector and back to corporate again. And I was one of the first people to join WWF from the corporate world. Uh, and I helped them build the way that they interacted and worked with companies, from being critical of companies to being more collaborative with companies. But after about seven or eight years of doing that, I felt that they needed to refresh the way that they were working. And so looked around for uh, an opportunity to do a secondment into a company. I was thinking of 12 or 18 months just to kind of recalibrate my understanding of the corporate world and I would go back into to WF and, and, and change the way that they were working. That didn't quite work out. I ended up uh, 10 years at, at, at Nestle, uh, who I left uh, two years ago. Uh, I took uh, early independence, and I've come uh, to live in the region. I live in, uh, in Kendall, where I do a, a variety of things. I've got an honorary position here at Lancaster. I, I work, uh, I'm a trustee, and I work uh, and volunteer in a, a small charity in Kendall, working on climate change and, uh, and food waste. Um, I get out into the fells as much as I can, so I always pick the nice days in the week for that. Uh, and I do a bit of consultancy as well. 
Um, and, as, and as Claire said, you know, there's, there's two parts to this, um, this talk tonight. Uh, I'm going to talk you a little bit through what happened over the 10 years at Nestle and how we changed from a not very good place that Nestle was in to a far better place. Um, and and the, whilst that will be about sustainability, it will be, be a little bit about my personal journey and therefore change management. I didn't go into it thinking it was a change management job, but in retrospect, of course, it became that. Uh, and there'll be some leadership things in there that I hope uh, some of you can, can take some inspiration from as well. But I'll then end up with, with you know, where are we in, in sustainability now uh, and, and tackle some of the issues as I see them. Uh, but I'm going to stop there because, you know, the first rule of public speaking is know your audience. And so I'd like to know the audience. Uh, I'd like to know what questions have you got? What would you like me to talk about through the next... 55 minutes or so. Because I'd just like to know how much emphasis do I give to certain things and see whether, I have plenty of stories. I have plenty of stories so I can, if you've got topics, then I can try and weave something in. So just let me know. I don't know whether we, we should probably be taking a mic around because we are recording this, so just for. Right, my name's Steve Dealer and I'm a director of Green Door, Lancaster Limited, which is a, a, a company that, that goes and does up old houses, completely refits them, and takes them from an EPC of, of E to an EPC of B or A. And as such, what we found was that we got no extra money, no extra money at all, in terms of the value of the property for, for incredible insulation. And from that, we could work out why it was not worth the while of anybody mm. insulating their house. Yep. And anybody, really. I, it, it, but there was a way why the government and the management of anybody who wants to do projects on this can work it out, that anybody can find out how to go about using that phenomenon in order to get just about everybody to insulate their house. How... How would you go about pushing something into, into government and into major companies to be able to at least show them what I put together to be able to get something through? I'm slightly to answer the question. So it's, it's about inspiration, but who pays yes. also is, is, is part of that. That's right. Yeah. How to get an inspiration through to a, a, a major, major person involved yeah. And would want to be able to go ahead, go ahead with this. Yeah, very good. Uh, good evening, Duncan. Uh, my name is Kevin Jackson. I work for an energy consultancy, Inspired Energy. Um, my question is, through your journey, um, when was success person or people-led? And, and I'm, I'm sure you, you take an amount of that on your shoulders. And when did it become process-led? So when does it become sustainable in itself because it becomes almost self-fulfilling? And, and on that journey, when it was people or process-led, how much is carrot and how much is stick? Uh. Okay, yeah. Good one. Yeah, oh, there's two more over here. Hi. I'm Russell Jackson from Ask Insurance Services. Um, just a quick one, what is sustainability and what does it look like? You might not be able to read my writing, but I can. Don't worry. Uh, hello, Brian Gregory. I'm interested, or I would be interested in your ideas around the balance of s sustainability and commercialisation, the need to make money, the need to make profit, and the need to save the planet. And Because we all know it's the right thing to do, but most people are nimbies and they don't want it in their own backyard, do they? Yep. 
Yeah. Deep, deep and meaningful questions here. <laughs> Thank you. I think we might need another hour. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Darren Hesketh. I'm uh, from Diamond Electronics. Um, started life as a distributor of electronic components. We now manage supply chains and we have manufacturing businesses. Um, I suppose the question that's always on my mind, um, looking at the whole picture of sustainability and ethics, is where to start. Oh, yeah. Some e not, I suppose low-hanging fruit, easy wins comes to mind, but something that we can do and do now to start that journey. Um, it's kind of on my plate to redo the CSR content of our website, and I don't want to just have a list of sort of platitudes. I actually want some concrete change. Yeah. And it's where to start. Yeah, yeah. That's the big no, question. it's very good. We'll definitely get into that. <laughs> Hello, my name's Victor, Gian Andrea. I like the views on B Corp. B Corp, okay. Yeah, anything else? I'm just looking at the time. Shouldn't use up too much of the, <laughs> it's a good trick, but. <laughs> just a, a further one to add on to, to, to where you start. How do you, how do you measure sustainability? How do you measure progress? Yeah. Okay, any final? No, okay. So, um, I'm actually going to start at the end, which is where Nestle is today. Um, and I know Nestle is uh, a controversial company to many in this country. Um, and I'm not here to change those views at all. Uh, it, it's, it's quite a strange company because in some countries it's absolutely loved. I mean, so it has this, it does this uh, uh, very different uh, profile in different places and a very different profile in terms of the products as well. So well known for confectionery in this country, but in other places, uh, big on coffee, uh, on pet food, uh, big on, uh, on, on cooking uh, and increasingly getting into uh, health uh, related foods as well. Um, but this is, this is where they are today. I, I went on their website just a couple of days ago. I, I took this as a, as a snapshot of how they report upon themselves a very comprehensive approach to sustainability. They're, they're tackling all the major issues there. And the important thing is that they've got pretty um, leading positions and targets and ambitions on those. So uh, in the last couple of years, for example, uh, they were, they, they've set uh, a science-based target for, for climate change uh, to net zero. They've got one of the most comprehensive roadmaps that you'll be able to, to find, uh, a very comprehensive approach to report into the task force and climate-related financial disclosures, similarly for regenerative agriculture and plastics and, and, and pretty much everything. Uh, so that, that's a little bit uh, where they are. Um, the recognition comes in from, from other places as well, so on, other, under whichever measure you want, you will see Nestle in the top two or three of the rankings that are prepared by uh, outside agencies, perhaps with the, with the exception of uh, the, the farm animal welfare, and, and, and that's one of the things. I'll come back to that because not everything went well, of course, and, and I don't want to paint a picture that, 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 that everything uh, did. So that's, that's a little bit where they are. The FTSE for good, I'll just mention that because why is that significant? When I joined Nestle, the FTSE for good excluded arms manufacturers, tobacco companies, and companies selling infant formula. And there was a huge piece of work which my colleagues did to change the way in which FTSE approached uh, infant formula. So it, it affected Danone and, and all of the other companies that, that, that were in that sector. It wasn't just Nestle specific. And so the fact that they're in the FTSE for good now uh, was a huge step forward in overcoming all of those legacy issues that, uh, that Nestle is known for. 
but as I went to Nestle, it was just after this happened, uh, and uh, Greenpeace went after Nestle about its use of palm oil uh, in Kit Kat. It is said to be, and there are business case studies of the, uh, uh, the, the, the campaign that, Nestle, uh, that Greenpeace had on Nestle because it was the first uh, campaign to supposedly use uh, social media to bring down a company. Uh, but the, and you know, the YouTube videos are there and they're, they're still online and if you haven't seen them, it's worth a giggle. Uh, what what, what was, was perhaps most, more of a shock for, for Nestle was the annual general meeting. Now you imagine the annual general meeting of a big company like Nestle, there's 2,000 people in the room. It's the big set piece affair. Uh, the, the preparation that goes into it uh, for, the, for the board members on, on the, the, the podium is just in, intense. And the CEO stands up to give his, his set piece speech and there's a big sound of a chainsaw which cuts a hole in the ceiling. And two guys wearing um, uh, gorilla suits or orangutan suits rappel down and put that big uh, sign up. They'd been living up there for 48 hours avoiding the security sweeps of, the, of, of the, the, the building. And of course it was disruptive. What on earth can you do? You can't do anything. Uh, you know, it is what it is. But there's a quote from uh, a gentleman who I'll come back to um, uh, later, uh, who was the chief operating officer. It was the guy that hired me. I reported to him. Uh, and he said, I'm thankful to Greenpeace. They helped us see things we knew were there but we didn't really want to acknowledge. And my own personal story in this is that 18 months before Greenpeace came through the roof, I went through the front door at Nestle and said, I think you've got an issue with palm oil. And they were, no, 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 we, it's okay. We, we, we're really big in coffee and milk and cocoa. You know, palm oil's small for us. Yeah, it's small. It's small because you're only 0.7% of the market, but that's still 400,000 tons. And so that's big. So they just didn't see it. Anyway, Greenpeace persuaded them, and I ended up walking again through the front door and getting a job with them. And at that time, um, this is where Nestle were. Now, these are, on the left-hand side, seven things that a company needs to be good at. It needs to have a commitment on sustainability or an ambition. It needs to be aware of their impact on the environment. It needs to be doing things, whether it's collaborating with retailers or, or uh, working with investors, um, working with other stakeholders and in industry to try and solve these common problems. And this is not me just saying that. This is actually based on Nestle research. They knew this. They just didn't know how to move forward on it. It was almost to the, where do we start? Um, and then on the right-hand side, there's three quotes from, uh, from friends and colleagues who, uh, who, who said to me before I went, uh, creating shared value was the way that Nestle talked about sustainability. It didn't use sustainability. It was Nestle. It was different. It actually talked about this thing called creating shared value, which was a, a concept that Michael Porter at Harvard had, had invented. And there's, there's, some, there's some solid logic to it, but nevertheless, it was seen as greenwashing. It was not understood. Um, and, and the last quote, I'm not sure about Nestle, they, they do their own thing. Well, they did do their own thing. So I come from an environment where I was sitting in, in WF talking to all of these companies and all of these organizations talking to each other, innovating, making progress, collaborating to try and move forward on sustainability issues. And Nestle was just off at the site. And it was off the side for two reasons. It didn't want to engage, and none of the others wanted to engage with it. And then just to finally set the, the scene as well, you know, these, these pictures we've been, I've been using for a long time, but, you know, they're just the same today, sadly. Uh, this is the, the state of, of, of the world. Uh, that we're in. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's common for, 
for companies at the time, certainly, to think that they are a little bit apart from society, not a part of society. And that was, that was very definitely, you know, we're business, we, you know, leave, leave, leave us to deal with, with, leave someone else to deal with, with those, those kind of things. And, and it gets a little bit worse when it comes to, uh, to agriculture and the, and the business that, that, that Nestle is in. Because these are the kind of pictures that, you know, a food company is not so comfortable with you seeing. And just to explain some of those, the top left is, is the fact that there's an awful lot of uh, uh, nutrient runoff, uh, excess use of fertilizers, which is uh, leading to all this algal growth in, in uh, certain parts of the world's oceans and creating these dead zones. So that's just that's off, uh, off the coast of China. And, and top right, uh, that's south of, uh, south of Spain. Those are, those are uh, um, greenhouses, uh, which is growing all your fruit and veg and salad stuff. But a few people shaking their heads. Yeah, it's, it's not good, is it? <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't expect your strawberries to, you think your strawberries have been grown in a nice little field with birds and bees. No, that's, it's that. And it's not a very good photo on the, the bottom left, but that's an aerial shot of a, of a feedlot system of, uh, of producing meat. So, you know. <sighs> When you, when, you, when you start to say, you know, what's the balance of sustainability and profit, uh, it's starting to be explained where we're starting from. But how do you create some value out of that sustainability so that you can change that system? Because to change that system is going to cost money. So, you know, fairly obviously what needed to change is that we needed to have some ambition. We needed to have a series of policies and targets, and I'll come on to those uh, in a moment. Nestle was also fixated with the view that it had 500 factories, which it did, um, and it was, that was its responsibility. It, it didn't see its responsibility down the value chain. Now, just to put that in perspective, the land area that Nestle depends upon to grow all the agricultural commodities is two and a half times the size of Switzerland, or 35 times the size of Lancashire. So there's a lot going on out there. The, there's stuff going wrong every day. It just needs someone with some eyes to bring it back into the, into the, the company and, and, and tell them what's going on. Of course, they wanted to show some leadership and pick a few things, and, and they picked nutrition and rural development and water. And I will, I will talk about what, how we approached the rural development story um, in, in, a, in a few more slides. Um, a, a few fairly obvious things. We needed to embed sustainability across the organization. What that meant was that we didn't want to create a sustainability team. You create a sustainability team, then people are going to say, well, I'm going to do my job. Those guys do sustainability. No, we wanted everyone to do sustainability. The only way we're going to succeed is, is if everyone plays their part in that. And, and it's, a bit, it's a bit obvious maybe to say you've got to see this as an opportunity, not a, a risk or a cost. Clearly, doing the right thing has an increase in cost. But if you flip it around... Where's the opportunity in this? Where's the opportunity for the, the marketing teams to, uh, to, to build a sustainability ethos into the, into the DNA of the brand? Where's the opportunity to, to make people proud of what they're doing? How we turned it around on, uh, on the palm oil um, was actually to say, OK, you're right, Greenpeace. Let's move on. This is what we're going to do. And they did some new things, and it made people proud. So I, I think, was the first person um, in the sustainability world with a very long, complicated title, but with the word stakeholder engagement in it. So my title was sustainability and stakeholder engagement. We made stakeholder engagement part of how we operationalized sustainability. And I'll, I'll come on to that. And then, and then how we communicated this. So I sat in the corporate operations. I reported to the chief operating officer. And it's normal in sustainability 
programs that the sustainability team is part of public affairs or corporate communications. And there is a difference. Now, they were going out and doing stakeholder engagement, and so was I. Uh, but we're different. They're going to go out because their job is to sell the company and make it look good. I was going in, out to do that because I needed the help of NGOs who were the experts. And I also wanted to be able to influence the thinking of the NGOs. Because in many cases, they were coming up with ideas, that were, and they were, they were just flying a flag. I knew because I used to do it myself. So, so, so we had to, we had to uh, change the way we were doing things and, and start communicating uh, based on what we were doing. So, we ended up talking a lot about these three things. Transparency, improvement, and engagement. And transparency meant that, as it says, we, we're transparent on things. We started by putting together um, policy commitments on, on a whole series of issues. We started with deforestation. I walked in on my first day and I went to the, the head of procurement and I said, um, you've made a commitment to no deforestation in your palm oil supplies and, and, and all of your other commodities. How, you know, where, where's, where's, where's the policy commitment on that? And he said, it's on the website. So I went to the website and he just said, we want no deforestation in our, in our commodities. I went back to Kevin and I said, Kevin, uh, how are you going to measure that? You don't, the, the, the countries of the world all have different definitions of what is a forest. And so unless you can define what is a forest, you don't know what's deforestation. And therefore, you can't measure progress. OK, he says, just, just, just write something. That, I see what you mean. Just write something that WF and Greenpeace and Oxfam and the rest will agree to. OK. So I, so I, I write. I'd been doing this. I'm a forester. I'd been doing it at WF. I, I wrote what I thought was a... Uh, half sensible uh, policy on for and by that I mean this is the situation this is what we understand this is what we believe and this is what we're going to do about it so I, I circulated I get a few comments but not many because people are going you know the first time they've seen this kind of thing so I so I, I take those comments I, I then write confidential not to be shared on the top and I send it by email to Greenpeace and WF and everyone else I could think of. And then I tell, and I tell everyone what I've done. And half the people go, really good what you're doing. Yeah, this is, this is really good. The other half is, what have you done? Um, what they didn't know in doing that is that the way NGOs think is that if they see confidential not to be shared and you've emphasized that in the email, actually they won't. They won't share it. But they will think, there's something genuine going on here. Let me put in my ideas. So, of course, I got loads of ideas from WF and Greenpeace and whatever. And that's the starting point of building trust with the outside world, with the NGOs. And we didn't guarantee to take and agree with all of their points that they were making. But when they saw the final policy come out, they could see the input they'd had. And we went back, of course, several times and said, we can't do this because, or have you thought about that, and challenged. And we got to a stage where we could have a decent dialogue backwards and forwards. So that was one. Uh, there was about uh, 10 or 12 of these in the end on, on all sorts of topics, water and human rights and child labor. We, set, we ended up um, uh, convincing the... Uh, the Fair Labour Association. The Fair Labour Association was, a, was set up to tackle uh, labour standards in the, um, the apparel industry. It was set up by Bill Clinton when he was in the, the White House. We persuaded, persuaded that entity to open up a, a, a line of work on, um, on, on agriculture and persuaded a few of our suppliers and, and competitors to come in and, and, and then we had a credible organization to help us work on, on child labor. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll come on to the child labor uh, thing, thing in a moment. Um, but, but we also spent a lot of time um, using these external rankings and ratings to, to, to push the agenda 
internally and to make people proud. And so there's nothing better than when you come top of these rankings that it gets spread around. We didn't talk about it too much, but internally it made a huge difference. And actually I would say that we use those to actually push us to do the right things. Until the point that they were not pushing us to do the right things. So after three or four years of working intensively on the ground, um, and you know, the work that we were doing on improvement was, was a lot about those commodities. 90% of the impacts that Nestle has is in its, in its commodity supply chain. And so you have to, first of all, know where that is. You've got to map it all the way down through tier one, tier two, tier three, all the way to the ground. Uh, and, and so there was, there was an awful lot of work on that. By the time we're starting to remediate the problems and change things on the ground, we're learning enough that we start to realize that the questions that CDP are asking are the wrong ones. And so the philosophy we took was, let's do the right thing on the ground. If as a consequence of that, we do well in these rankings, then fine. And so actually, the, the rank, we, we dropped down a bit on the rankings uh, in, in the, uh, after about 2015 because we, they weren't moving fast enough to recognize what, what we had to do on the ground to change things. But that, so that was one thing. Improvement, as I said, a huge amount of work on the ground uh, to, uh, to, to understand where were our supplies coming from, what was the uh, status of those suppliers, how were they, were, they, were they meeting what we wanted to achieve through our policies, and then helping them. And if they didn't want to be helped, they were out. Now, I would also say that, that that had really significant implications for the business. Uh, because, uh, and it's the same, this, this is publicly available information, Mars have talked about it as well. There were several thousand suppliers supplying us with palm oil uh, in 2010. Uh, by 2020, it was down to less than 100. So there was a, 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 a real change in the way that the business uh, had to work. But the improvement went on in, in all directions. So uh, the middle photo there is, is a, a zero water factory. Uh, where we were taking in uh, cow's milk, uh, running the whole factory by recirculating the, the water from within the milk uh, rather than drawing anything out of the ground. Um, the, the, the top one is uh, the, the, the Kinabatangan River in Malaysia, in Sabah in Malaysia, where we took over a project from, from WF to start restoring uh, plants along the riverside. The palm oil plantations had come right up against the river destroying all of the corridors that the elephants would be walking down. So we persuaded all of the palm oil companies to pull back and then we could replant and re-establish re that. And, and that now, you know, that was several years ago and people said, that's crazy, why on earth are you doing that? But actually now that is uh, really a strategy that all companies are, are using in terms of what is the approach to, to, to stopping and going beyond, defore stopping deforestation and going beyond to restoring uh, the, uh, the, the, the landscapes in those places. And then down below, we realized that if you wanted to be a successful coffee farmer, then you had to be a successful farmer. And, and, and this lady I met in, in Kenya, we sad to say, in the year 2018, 19, 20, we're teaching people how to grow their own food and be self-sufficient in food. You know, agricultural extension schemes of been cut around the world and people have forgotten how to do that. And so make sure they've got enough food for their families and then they can be a, a successful coffee farmer. And finally engagement, and I, I, I've, I've talked a, a, a bit about this, but I, I think that, so we, we, we joined Cambridge University and I'll come on to, to, to some of that work uh, later. We joined uh, the World Business Council because uh, they, they, they bring together about 200 companies. And whilst we were going to places and, and meeting our competitors, um, we knew them. We, we couldn't learn anything from them. What we wanted to do was learn from Sony and Lafarge and Novartis and, uh, and, and other companies in other sectors. So we, so we joined the World Business Council. And, and when it came to engaging with, with NGOs, I, I've given you a flavor already, but... Having come from WWF, there was a, 
an expectation from WF people as well as Nestle people that we'd be able to figure out a way of collaborating and have some kind of partnership, work together, and, and the soft endorsement that would come from working with WF would do wonders for the Nestle brand. I took, and we took, we took a different view. We said, no, let's go to the campaigning NGOs because they talk as things are. WF, you're always wondering, you know, I don't want to hit WF because there are other NGOs that, that raise money from companies as well. But they're always looking at how they can raise money. Whereas Greenpeace doesn't take money from companies. It's going to tell you how it is. And so we always knew we were getting an uh, 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 unalloyed <laughs> view of things. Um, and just to show you how far we took this, um, in about 2015, I suppose, um, the head of responsible sourcing program who, who reported to the chief procurement officer, we were having a chat over lunch and we realized that neither of us had been to a palm oil plantation uh, in 18 months. And we were just getting some indications that actually the problem for palm oil was going to be smallholders. So 40% of palm oil comes from smallholders. And all the work that everyone is doing had been on the big companies. So we, we said, we, we've actually really got to understand the smallholders. How are we going to deal with that? And we were also, palm oil at that stage, people were starting to realize this was not just a story of deforestation. This was a story of, of social issues, of worker standards, of human rights, if not forced labor uh, within that. So we wanted to, to, to understand that as well. So we, we told our, uh, three of our suppliers in, uh, in Indonesia that we were going to come for a week to visit them and, and travel around and see what they were doing. And these were the topics that we wanted to, to talk to them about. Oh, and by the way, we're going to bring Greenpeace and uh, Rainforest Action Network and Forest People's Program with us. And by that stage, they're really nervous. Oh, and by the way, they're going to organize half of the week. Because you know what it's like if you go out and see suppliers. You get, you know... You travel halfway, you fly halfway around the world, you drive in a Jeep for ages, you're tired, and you get shown what you get shown. We actually wanted the NGOs to show us what they wanted to show us, not what the companies wanted to show us. And, and I have to say, it was one of the most, um, it was one of the best things we ever did. But it was really tough, because we, get, we got taken to some tough places. And I'm just looking at the... At the, at the time clicking over. I'll, I'll, I, can, I can finish that story uh, over, over, over coffee uh, afterwards. Otherwise, I'll never get yet to the end. Um, so, that was, so that was a little bit, you know, how we approached that and how we used NGOs really as part of our operational strategy. I'd phone these people every, every month. We'd have a phone call. They'd tell me what was going on. I'd tell them what was going on. We'd challenge each other. And as I said... They're always flying flags as to what they think you can do, but if you get to a point where there's a relationship that you can actually work together, then, then it's much better. And you can stop them doing some silly things. They, they also, of course, in their campaigning work, they, of course, want to highlight some bad things, but they always need a, an example of a company that's doing, doing the right thing, because that makes their argument so much easier to get across. And that's, that's where we wanted to position ourselves as, as, the, as the company that was not, not collaborative. I don't really care about collaborating. I always used to tell them, look, you've got to hold, you hold up a mirror and tell us how we're doing. I don't want an easy time from you. But, but I will, if you're talking sense, do stuff and help show you that it's possible. The other thing that we, that we did was to... Um, was to work on a few things and develop some, some logic and some, ac some activity as well on things that people wouldn't expect Nestle to be talking about. And so very early on, we started talking about nature and the dependency that Nestle had on nature and the impact that it has on nature. And so the dependency, you know, it, it's less now, but it still owns some uh, premium bottled water um, businesses. Uh, and, and the forests around that. So it was managing, uh, owning and managing some, some pretty nice forests in some places. And that's a fairly obvious dependency that it has on nature because it has to manage those to keep the purity of the water. But um, it always used to kind of uh, shock people when I said, you know, we've got to be careful of the coral reefs. 
because these coral reefs are where the tuna spawn, which then swim into the Gulf of Thailand that we catch and put into pet food. There won't be any tuna in the future if you don't look after the coral reefs. So we, we took those, those types of arguments off to the, to the Rio uh, summit in, uh, in 2002. Um, and I, I think for the first time, the assembled NGOs and government delegations saw a company that was starting to talk sense and starting to shed some light on how companies might deal with nature. And of course, this is now... Uh, what we were doing is, is now reflected in things like the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, uh, which, is, which is going to be the next, the next big thing in sustainability. But we also, did it, we also worked on, on people as well. And, of course, we knew quite a lot. Uh, Nestle was, was buying directly from 500,000 farmers, and we knew quite a few of them. Um, I've met those, those two ladies, the first one in, in Vietnam and, and the second one in, in, in Kenya. Um, but there's this kind of slightly out of focus workforce out there that, that we didn't know about. And the normal line of argument that companies would use is that the, the amount of money that, that is spent on, on, on paying people, on, on, on employees, is a positive contribution to society. And we said, no, it's not. Because what happens if some of those workers are paid less than the minimum wage? I mean, you could take it to an extreme and say, what happens if they're slave labor? That is not a contribution to society. And so a contribution to society is only if you're paying a wage which is a decent, gives a decent living, which is way above a minimum. Oh, and by the way, you can do it from the other direction as well. If you've got a CEO paid 10 million a year, that's not a contribution to society either. So there is a sweet spot in between. Now, of course, other companies didn't like it when we said this, but and we didn't. And I have to say, it's one of the. I, I don't have I don't have a massive regret on this because I think it'll I think it'll come round again, but we we didn't manage to land that completely in, in Nestle, uh, but we did in Novartis. Novartis saw that and took it on. And you can look at the Novartis the way Novartis reports now on the impact that it makes on society, and it directly uses that that research that we did, and, that, and we've published that. You can, find it on the, you can find it on the internet. Now, there's always a turning point in these kind of things. And the turning point came on, on rural development. And so, I know you're looking at this. Well, I'll, I'll explain the right-hand side first. So, so we, we decided, um, a, colleague, a colleague and I, we'd, we'd written the annual report. And, you know, a company the size of Nestle, you put the annual report together and you can always find enough nice stories from somewhere in the world to, to write a, a, you know, some nice text as to what's happened and what you're doing. But we said, you know what, if we really want to be leaders on, on rural development, then we need to be able to show some progress. So what you see here, and this, this was four years of work to get to this point, but that's a baseline that we carried out in Philippines. I think we did about 18 of these. Uh, this is from our coffee, from the Neste Coffee um, communities. And we, we've gone out and we've, we've, we've looked at a whole series of indicators that would help us better understand uh, who, were the, who were our farmers, who were the, what, what state were they in, what, what was the community that they lived in. And from that, how are we going to, at the same time as we're buying coffee, deliver a better livelihood for them. And so you can see things like on the, you know, 31% of the farm owners were, were women. That was an insight for us because... Less than 10% of the people turning up to our training courses were women. So we were clearly doing something wrong in how we were setting up the training courses. 54% um, of farmers are food insecure for at least two to three months. That was the basis for the photo I showed you before where we're going out and teaching farmers to grow food to be self-sufficient for their families. as almost a precondition for 
for, uh, for, for coffee production. And, and, you know, I said it many times, these are not coffee farmers, they're farmers. They're growing all sorts of other crops, so, so let's help them, help, help them with that. So, so, that's, so we, had, we had all these baselines from which we could measure progress. Now, we did that by starting to work with, the, with Solidaridad, and they were the first NGO that we worked with um, at a time when no one wanted to talk to Nestle. And so we signed, we, we wrote a contract with, with Solidarity for six months. They're a Dutch-based NGO who worked with, with smallholder farmers. They were instrumental in setting up fair trade and their notes. Uh, and then they, they work with small farmers, believing that trade is a way that can um, help deliver uh, impro livelihood improvements. We signed a contract with them for six months to work together. And we explicitly said, no communication. We won't talk about it. You won't talk about it. Um, and that was the only way we could get started. But having got started, we were then able to bring in Fair Labour Association, who I mentioned before, the Danish Institute for Human Rights and the Rainforest Alliance. And halfway through that process, Oxfam decided it was going to run a campaign against 10 of the biggest food companies in the world about how those companies were dealing with things like women and labor and, uh, and climate and water and, and, and all sorts of other things. And so we used that process. They, they, they came to us, they came to all the companies. Not all the companies decided to collaborate, we decided to collaborate. And we then had this dialogue backwards and forwards with, with Oxfam about what questions they should be asking, what's possible, what's not possible. Anyway, they finally went away and did the, the calculation um, we filled in the forms and did the calculation of, of, of who, who came out on top. And I've been told by someone in Oxfam that this publication was delayed because several Oxfam staff could not believe that Nestle was at the top. Um, and this was the turning point. It's... You know, I could get our CEO to go and talk about all the good stuff we're doing. He could do that a hundred times, a thousand times, but Oxfam saying it once, that was enough. Now, what happened is Oxfam carried on with this campaign for two or three years. Uh, the scores gradually went up, apart from some companies who <laughs> refused to play ball, who pretty much stayed where they are. Um, but, but that, was, that was the tipping point. That was the, the, the moment in which suddenly organizations of all kinds wanted to come and talk to Nestle, understand what we were doing and how we were doing it. Uh, so that opened, the, that opened the gates for us. So uh, just a couple of slides then to, uh, to end this section. Um, I came, I, as, I said, as I said at the start, I, it only became apparent that this was a change management program <laughs> once we were well down the line uh, and someone asked me to talk about change management. I came with some political capital from WWF. Uh, no one of my age generally joins Nestle and stays there for that amount of time. Um, so so that, that, brought, that brought political capital. And the chief executive, the chief operating officer, sorry, was also instrumental uh, in, in creating the right tone, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that in a, in a moment. Um, his, his ask of me was to help Nestle interpret the world outside. I didn't get a job spec when I joined. I joined as a, as a contractor. After two years, I then became full-time and permanent. So there was no job spec. He actually said to me when I, on my first day, he said, uh, spend six months, get to know us, go around the world and meet people and whatever, and then come back and tell us, tell me what you think you can do. And I started to do that, but after three months, I went back and I said, Jose, look, I, I don't know everything about Nestle, but this is what I think we can do. And he looked at the list, he said, half that list, and then we'll start. And that's how we started. And, you know, so he basically, he said, don't tackle everything. You go where the doors are open. The company's so big, there's so much to do. 
And, you know, I, I did have to, and of course, they're all coming with, with, with a proud history. They don't want to be told that everything's wrong. So, you know, I, I had to draw a few lines in the sand to, 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 to stand behind a few things. But that's, I was basically encouraging, encouraging the action. I always used to say that my role was to challenge and to catal catalyze and to connect. And the connection part is, is really about, you know, networking like crazy inside and out. And, and I was always looking for, for my personal, I was starting things off but looking for my personal exit strategy. And somewhat related to that, I had no budget. Okay, I had a little budget, but, but I told people I had no budget. And the point of that was a, a little bit around the same, the same idea as, as, as not having a sustainability team. If I had a budget, people would say, oh, you, you can pay for that. If you want to do it, then you pay for it. Um, and so I, but it also forced, forced this thinking, to your point, what's the logic that's going to convince someone to do something that's going to cost more because it's the right thing to do? You had to be really, really focused on, 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 on finding that, that logic. But again, because there was so much to do, the difficult ones got left for the, <laughs> for the end. So, for example, plastics. We, we knew plastics was an issue in 2012. And uh, it didn't blow up into the, the big thing it is now until about 2018. Uh, in that period, we did some work on microplastics because we had a, a, a skin health company that was using microplastics, so we eliminated all the microplastics. But there was just too much to do, too many easier things to, to go for. So we went for those. And then, of course, by the time there was enough pressure outside on plastics, we'd done, in, we'd done a little bit of preparation, but we were ready to go. And, and so, so it was all about finding the right timing to deal with it. And so I've talked about this guy um, a bit. I'm not going to claim that, that any of us would were able to do what we did without his um, framing of, of, of what we were doing. And these are actually some of his quotes. And, and, and a few of us put a, when he, when he retired from Nestle, a few of us put a book together that's gone through two prints, actually, uh, of all his, all his best quotes. I picked out a few. And I've picked out a few that are, that are relevant for sustainability, but they're relevant for change management, and they're, they're actually relevant for leadership as well. So, so, you know, great leadership is, is not about vision. It's about operationalizing the vision. And he was, he was big on operationalizing. So you can have a vision or a strategy, and there's a plan to implement it. But that plan's going to fail unless you prepare the ground for that plan. And that's what operationalizing is about. It's, it's a distinctive phase of how to do things, especially in a big company, I would say. You'd then say... Don't push, create, pull. So you can have all the best ideas in the world, and you can push them like crazy. But unless people are willing to receive them and pull them, you're not going to get anywhere. And, and to give you the example, we're in operations doing all this great stuff. If marketing is not able to pick some of that up, take those ideas and those solutions and build them into the branding and the position of the product, then you're just pushing water uphill. So, so he, 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 he was strong on this push and this pull. This is one that, this is one that uh, changed the circumstances. He used to talk about that a lot. I think we all understand what context is. Um, I can perhaps, it, 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 if you wanted to change something, he was always saying change the circumstances. Let me give you one example, a very simple example. How you change circumstances, like all answers, it depends. But... We did all of this work on, on child labor. We thought we were doing work on child labor. We, had, we then got to a point where we said, it's not working. We hired the Fair Labor Association that I spoke about to go out and, and look at uh, eight, eight uh, cooperatives that we were sourcing cocoa from in Cote d'Ivoire. Now, these eight cooperatives have all got a certification behind them. They've all got Rainforest Alliance or something like that. So theoretically, having been certified, there shouldn't have been any child labor. 
After six weeks on the ground, the, uh, the Fair Labour Association found 169 children that they associated with child labour. Now, once we put in place the remediation programme, by 2019, that was 18,000. So it depends how you look and, and how you do things. But the whole industry was in a little bit of denial. And Jose went on CNN, live on CNN. If, if you, you may know Richard Quest. He runs the business program on CNN. So Richard Quest, live, live TV, said to Jose, for how long have you been buying cocoa with child labor? How, how would you answer that question? <laughs> That's exactly what he said. And the lawyers were kind of going, what the hell has he said? Because, the, at least in the US, that potentially creates a legal liability. But it was like a cloud lifting from, from the shoulders of everyone in the company. A weight lifting from our shoulders. Because suddenly, he'd made it okay to talk about child labor. It wasn't a case of standing in front of a journalist and saying, well, you know, it's really difficult. This is what we're doing. And we haven't found any case. Or we, you know, we got one last year. You know, no. It's okay to talk about it. It changed the circumstances. 18,000. I don't know what the latest is, but the next, I haven't looked recently, but it was 18,000. So, so it was a big deal, and it had to be dealt with, and it had to be dealt with in a different way. So that was what he would talk about, changing the circumstances. He always used to tell me, um, I'd, I'd have my next idea, and I'd go to him, and he said, yeah, go on and do it. Don't create any antibodies. Having come through COVID, I think we understand what that means. I mean, <laughs> you have to set out and, you know, act like a virus uh, to infect everyone to do what you want them to do. What you don't want in that circumstance is an antibody. Talk the walk. Now, everyone says walk the talk. He's, he was absolutely convinced it's not walk the talk, it's talk the walk. You do things. And then you go and talk about it. And when you talk about it, you communicate what is your logic and you communicate the activities you've done. So the credibility of your communication is actually built upon something. It's not built on some empty promises of, yeah, we're going to do X, Y, Z. It's actually, this is what we've done. And I've said this before, you, you go where the doors are open. Stop investing in places where you need to convince the organization. Um, I like this one. We've decided to fight complexity with complexity. When you fight complexity with simplicity, you lose. The objective is not to reduce complexity. Managing complexity does not sell one more case. And you all know the difference between simplicity, uh, simple solutions and complicated and complex. Yeah? So a simple solution is bake a cake. You get a recipe, you buy the ingredients, you follow the, the instructions, you've got a cake. A complicated situation is Elon Musk, he sends his Tesla to Mars. A lot can go wrong, but you can plan for it. And once you've done it once, you can do it again, and again, and again. A complex problem is raising a child. The outcome's not necessarily going to be the same the second time around. And just because you learned the first time doesn't necessarily help you quite so much the second time. So this is important because the sustainability world is complex and interconnected. Can't simplify it down. And then he, and then he always advocated lighthouses, not pilots. No one wanted to, to uh, be involved in a pilot because a pilot's a pilot. You know, it's someone money's being given and whatever comes out of it comes out of it. No, he wanted a lighthouse. He wanted you to build something that would inspire others to come, that would shine a light. And so everything we did was a lighthouse. It wasn't a pilot. At which point, I'll take a breather because my time's out, but I've got five more slides. <laughs> so the question is, do you, wanna, do you want any more? Because I know you wanted to hear about ESG and sustainability. <laughs> Crack 
crack on. <laughs> We've got till quarter past, but, <laughs> but I, I've got to make sure I answer these, <laughs> these questions. OK, so I'll speed up a bit. Um, yeah, there's an, the, maybe I'll, very quickly, the, the, there is an evolution of sustainability thinking, which is, you know, we, we started with, a, with philanthropy and then it moved on to kind of business risk. And, and, and then how can you use sustainability for competitive advantage and finally societal co uh, contribution. And Nestle, of course, through its creating shared value, was trying to jump from philanthropy to societal contribution, realizing you can't go that direction. It, it, it kind of goes around. And I would think that any company is probably throughout its operations, somewhere in all of those, to be honest. It, it doesn't mean that a company moves progressively around it. There, there'll be bits of what they do, which, 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 is, it, which is in all of those. Now, a bit more complicated. Uh, and maybe I'll leave this as a slide, because I think it, it'll go up on the website, will it? Yeah, but uh, you know, taking inspiration from quantum physics, I, I think sustainability has certain quantum characteristics. Uh, so in quantum physics, you've got entanglement. So you've got this interconnectedness of issues. You know, so you can't work on, on climate alone. You've got, to, you've, you've, you've got to connect that in some way with biodiversity, with inequality, all these, all these things. You can't work in isolation. But which is good because actually it means you can enter from different places. I, we used to talk about more about biodiversity than climate at, 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 at Nestle. But you know, if we were going to when the climate cops, of course we'd talk about climate. And then we talk about what we're doing on climate, and oh, by the way, that's, that's delivering on biodiversity. If I was going to the, the biodiversity corp, I'd be talking about biodiversity, and oh, by the way, that in doing this, it, the, the consequence is that we're dealing with climate. So you've got these different entry points and, and ways to, to appeal to different audiences. Um, there is uncertainty driven by that complexity, uh, which, which leads to a certain paralysis. And you know, who asked the question, where do you start? You just start somewhere doesn't matter just start you're not going to make a mistake now you might want to kind of rank things a little bit but you've basically got to jump in there and and because of this interconnectedness and this uncertainty people have different perspectives and interpretations and and so and so yes yeah, start somewhere but but think of the product and the consumer above all what would be sensible for them do they expect you to be talking, because of whatever product you have, do they expect you to be talking about inequality or climate or biodiversity? Which one do they expect you to be talking about? So create your logic around that and some action around it, and then, you, then you've got a coherent way of talking according to your product or the services that you've got. And I think we've got to, we've got to recognize you know, is it sustainability or, or profit? Well, there are trade-offs, quite frankly. You eliminate slave labor from your value chain and actually it's going to cost you, not only because you've got to find it, but actually you're going to, your workers are going to have to be paid. So you, you've got to check, you, you know. So, so how, you, how do you deal with that? Well, I will, I will come on to that uh, in a moment. Uh, so there is a lot of talk about ESG at the moment. This is a... A, a slide that Jan Bebbington and I, um, you'll find it on the Pentland Centre uh, website. It's a blog that we put out a couple of weeks ago um, because there is a lot of confusion and conflation of the terms. So if you go back five years, investors were talking about ESG. And for them, they didn't really talk about the environment much or the social bit much, but they used that as a proxy for, um, for governance, how good is management, and, and it was then another way in which they looked at the quality of management. Now, of course, it's just, in the last couple of years, it's just absolutely exploded. But, I mean, there's a, there's a lot in this that I'm not going to go through, but let me just try and put into perspective the consequences of poor ESG performance is that the share price goes down. Pension fund valuation goes down. The consequence of poor sustainability is that people lose their lives, forests get cut down, rivers run dry. So you have the, it's this concept of double materiality which we put in there, which actually end up influence, one influence and the other, so you have, you have dynamic materiality. But it's basically this ESG is, what is the impact of this issue on the company? 
whether sustainability is what's the impact of the company on this issue. There will be another blog coming out shortly on, uh, on biodiversity. Um, I think there are three main drivers for sustainability these days. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you will say, you haven't put governments there. <laughs> so to your question on governments, I hesitated because I'm, I'm just not confident that governments get it and have the, the willingness or the, I don't know, capacity to deal with it. So you get asset managers, of course, that are driving sustainability in two ways. They're driving it from a systematic point of view across all industries, uh, across all uh, companies, and that's things like Climate Action 100 Plus. You've also got then this TCFD task force on, on uh, climate-related financial disclosure, which is the ESG approach. It's asking, what is the impact of climate change on the company? Companies have never really had to think about that in the past. And it's, it's, it's proven really quite interested in the English use of the phrase to, um, to, to, to work out how companies would report upon that. And you've got consumers. Um, and I think that you, know, you can see the figures there. The ones that you should be worried about are the 40 to 60%, the concerned ones. Because those are the consumers who love your product today and will continue loving it until the day they don't. And I put a bit of a question mark around employees. I don't mean employees like an individual like myself who can do what he can in a company, but the, the fact that a collective of employees can do things. So you see the examples of Microsoft who've had to stop selling products to certain clients because their employees have been activating against that. I, I leave a question mark there because I think it's, a, I think it's an interesting place where a bit more research is needed. I think it's a good, good one for, 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 the, for the university. And then finally, uh, so like I said, didn't, didn't ask me to put this up, but I, I decided I, I, I wanted to, largely because right from the start at our time in, uh, my time in Nestle, we, we worked with, with universities. Um, the one example I'll pick out is, is the University of Cambridge, which helped us understand uh, natural capital how to think about the relationship that we had with nature, the dependency that we had upon it and the impact that we had upon it. And that led to us being one of the, 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 the core companies that, that drove the creation of the Natural Capital Coalition. We ended up doing some work with Green Alliance, selected us to do some work with them on, on natural capital uh, with the government here in, uh, in the UK. And of course, when when the new platform came al along, uh, One Planet Business for Biodiversity, uh, we were ready. We'd, we'd, we'd got all the work. We'd got all the examples. So we'd, we could come with something ready to, to give. And um, when we needed to understand, two or three years ago, we, when we needed to understand the task force on climate-related financial disclosure, rather than hiring a, a consultancy company who, quite frankly, we would have taught how to do this, we came to... Lancaster because they were able to put together the accountancy experts, the climate change experts, the agriculture experts, and they were able to come and we were able to sit around the table and it was unique in my experience in Nestle because we managed to get their counterparts from around Nestle and have a discussion. And we were able to embed it right into the, the company. I, uh, whilst I started that work, it was then the, the enterprise uh, risk management uh, team that took that forward. Uh, and so, you know, I think there's a, there's a role that academia has which is non-judgmental, and I say that comparing uh, academia coming in versus NGOs. NGOs come in with, a, with, a, with an agenda. Um, my experience of working with academia is they come in around the science and the facts. And, and so that's how we, that's how we progressed. And, um, and that's it. And there's a million ways that we can stay in touch, um, mainly those. Thank you so much. <laughs> You've got a minute for questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, did I? Hopefully, I talked a little bit about inspiration. People led versus... 100% people led. Yeah. 
Yeah. Even to the point you just identified two people that changed the whole of Nestle. Yeah. On the face of it, single handedly, I'm sure there was one or two other No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> No, yeah. Um, that's a tough one. There's no doubt about it. It's going to cost. All the easy sustainability stuff has been done. What happens from now on is going to cost. And Boris Johnson ought to be a lot careful than he is at the moment in saying technology is going to get us to net zero. Sorry, it's going to cost money from now on. Um, I, I, don't, I didn't explicitly say that, but I hope there's, there's enough things that I've said that answers what is sustainability and what does it look like. Where to start? Well, that's where I started. Um, how do you measure progress? Um, well, there's a few nuggets in there. We can talk about that at the bar. And B Corps. I, my sense on B Corps is that they are best for companies that want to drive change from inside. I think they really appeal to employees. I think if you want to be employee-led in your sustainability journey, I'd go that way. Um, I don't know if B Corps have enough um, public recognition to use it in, in branding at the moment. Um, it can be part of the story, that's for sure, but I, but I would think it's, it's, it's more about getting that whole bind from the whole organization to do it. So it probably works best for smaller companies than bigger companies. I've spoken too much. Sorry. I think we can throw our hands together. So, Duncan, that was, I mean, I found it so, um, so inspirational and so interesting. And I think it's, uh, you know, raised a lot of questions. But I think, I mean, I go back, it's actually, it's people. And it's, it's being able to manage people and being able to communicate and I, I liked the, the little um, quotes that you had from, from Jose. I thought they were absolutely fantastic. And I think for any leader, there's something that, that we can learn from all of them. So I think we have time afterwards. I don't think we've just time now, but I think we've time in the bar afterwards. Yep, or that I'll be there. We'd have nibbles, actually. <laughs> You're only going to the West Pavilion. <laughs> we're not <laughs> going to Lancaster House Hotel. Um, and have an opportunity to network and, and, and to share um, more stories and, and insights and, and, and learning. So um, the next masterclass is in June, and it's going to be in the 22nd. And it was one of the companies, um, actually, that you had in your slide, Unilever. So Sue Garrod is the former EVP for Sustainability, Business, and Communications at Unilever will be coming. And I think it's interesting, actually, the choice of words there, because I th communications being such a vital part um, of all of this. So we have... Um, Previous leadership insights, and you mentioned Jan Bebbington, so we had Jan and Sarah Brennan, and there's a QR code on the screen. I think that's, we want to start the conversation again. We want, we're really keen. We, it has continued through the pandemic, but we want to start it now um, physically and, and virtually. So there'll be an opportunity. The slides will be made available. Duncan's very kindly said that, so we will we'll circulate those. And as I said, this is the starting point of a conversation, and we'll have a lot more through the rest of the, the Masterclass series. So thank you for coming tonight, for asking such good questions and shaping, and actually having a say in shaping the, the presentation. I think it was really, really um, interesting and fascinating. So thank you all once again, and we can go outside and um, have some, some light refreshments. Thank you. Thank you.